<laughs> you know, he was finished before we're going to start today. And we have to do a blot and a quarter. This is your better profile. I don't really care. I, it does, they don't have this. Better profile. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I use a sleep apnea machine. I could be present. Why are you using sleep apnea? He it was in the news yesterday. He just got prescribed sleep apnea. All right. If you sell your slave to a non-Jew. In Israel, or even to a Jewish person outside of Israel, he becomes a free man. So there are two reasons for the selling to a non-Jew. One, remember that a slave has tvila and bris, so he's really Jewish, but he's like a woman. He's potter from mitzvahs has a shahazman grama because he has to work for his master. He can't stop plowing the back 40 to go to Daven Mincha. But if you sell the good, the Jew to a non-Jew, sell the slave to a non-Jew, number one, from a Torah perspective, non-Jews cannot own slaves. Non-Jews can have indentured servants. In other words, you can sell his services so he's like an indentured servant, but you can't sell his body. That's one. And the other is, since he's Jewish and the non-Jew is going to tell him to go work on Shabbos or to eat pork chops, we, we're worried that he won't do the mitzvahs that he's mechayif to do. With regard to selling him to a, even a Jew, Chutz Oretz, we may or may not like it, but there is an affirm, a positive mitzvah to live in Israel. There are more mitzvahs that you can only perform in Israel than there are chutz l'aretz. And uh, there is even a memory that God is not with us when we're chutz l'aretz. So if you sell the Jew, this, this Evet, to a, not, to a person outside of Eretz Israel, he's violating the law that you have to live in Israel. And, therefore, and that's a halacha. So therefore, he goes free. Okay. What? Hashem is not outside of. There's a, the guy, he, of course he is, but the Gemara says that the difference between Chutz Laaretz and Israel is so great that it's as if there's no God outside of Israel. The Gemara says that we learned that, so don't give me a hard time. No questions today because we have to cover a lot of ground. Tanu Rabbanus. Amarcha, we're repeating the first clause of the Mishnah. A ton of rabbanon. Rabbis taught the Bryce, Amarcha, Avda, Love, De Kachavim, Yotza, Lacherus, Vitsorech, Gat, Shacharur, Barab, Me, Rabba, Rishon. The original owner, according to this Bryce, has to give him a release document. Okay? Rabbi Shimon ben uh, Gamliel, oh my Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, the Matvar Memorim, what exactly are we talking about? Shalok Kosova love Ainai. That's if the master did not give him a document that's called an Ono, which is, which is usually translated as papers or a document. Okay? Aval Kosova love Aino, but if he did give him such a document, Zeho Shacharoru, that document is a valid star Shacharorus, and the guy goes, it doesn't need more. So the Gemara asked, my owner, what exactly is this document? Omer of Sheshes, the Kosov Lehachi. You give him a piece of paper on which it says, Likishativ Rach Mimenu. If you manage to escape from the Goyish me owner, so to speak, with quotes around it, 
I will have no further dealings with you. So since a master has intimate relationship with the slave, his statement, I'll have nothing to do with you in the future, constitutes his freedom document. Next case, we're going to now talk about that Mishnah a little bit. Tana Rabbanan, lova alav min of the kachavim. If a Jew borrows money from a non-Jew and he gives him the slave or designates the slave as collateral on the loan. So if the loan is due August 1st, if he pays it fine, the slave comes home. If the slave does not, if he does not pay it, the guy keeps the slave, okay? Kevin Shaosala of the Kachavim Nimuso. If this goy does something called Nimuso, okay, which is usually translated the customary way he identifies his slave, okay, Yatsala Kheris, then that it, this is the collateral slave. But if the non-Jew treats the collateral slave in such a way that he's publicly indicating he now owns him, this could be even prior to the payment of the debt, okay? Then the slave get, goes free and the first master has to write the star. My Nimuso, what do we mean by Nimuso? Omar of Rav Huna Bar Yehuda, Nashki. He puts a seal on him. It, it like, well, like Bismana said, you have a, a flock of cattle. You put your brand on the cow. Nobody else has a similar brand. So you know it's your cow. So the, the goy makes some kind of a marker that, we, that they, publicly one is aware this is his slave. So we're going to challenge that. So, okay, so in other words, we're making a statement here that you identify ownership with a marker. Macy Rav Sheshis, he complain, he objects to that. Now we're going to have a list of three categories of relationships that were standard relationships between landowners and persons who would farm their land. Okay, and the different categories are Ha'arisin, a sharecropper. A sharecropper works the, uh, this is a goy's land in this case, works the goy's land for an agreed upon percentage of the crop by volume. So uh, he, he gets 75%, the owner gets 25, he gets 60, the owner gets 40. Whatever it, whatever agreement they make. Vaha Chakiras. This is a tenant farmer. The farmer pays a stipulated amount of money or grain to the landowner, and he keeps whatever profits there are. That's a sharecropper. Okay. What? Well, it it's not a tenant. A tenant has, a tenant rents the land. He doesn't rent the land. That's the key here. He rents the right to work the land and derive revenue from what his work repre represents and gives rent I mean, and gives money to the owner to obtain this right. But he doesn't, rent the land. That's critical because you'll see in a minute, okay? And then the Arise Bateavos or this piece of land has been owned by the Goy for 500 years and this Jewish family has been sharecropping that land generation after generation after generation. Okay? The uh, or and those are three cases of relationships or or the Jew lends money to the goy and the goy 
get takes out a, by taking out a mortgage on his land. So the Jew now has a mortgage, holds a mortgage on the Goy's land. And if the Goy doesn't pay, the Jew will own it, right? He'll, re, he'll repossess it. Ptura min hamaiser. In all these cases, the Jewish uh, farmer does, or, or in the case of the Jewish banker who is giving, being given the right to work the land as interest, so to speak, does not have to pay Meiser, take Trumas and Meisters on the produce because it's the Goyish land and he doesn't own it. He doesn't rent it. Got it, Bob? That, okay, that's why I insisted, okay? The Esau Kedai if you feel that there has to be some kind of a physical marker or sign on the land to show who's the owner of it. So the Vasnaki, can you mark a piece of land like you can brand a slave? So Naki, so we're concerned that that word mostly doesn't mean marker. Okay, Ella, Omer of Sheshes is man. What it means is a determined time frame. If I don't pay by August 1st, you keep the slave. If I don't pay the mortgage off by 2025, you get the land. Okay? So, so now we have a conflict between the two prices. In the first price, where the Jew gave the slave as a mashkan to the goy, there was a due date for that loan. And in the second case, where the Goy gives the land as collateral to the Jew, there's a due date for that loan. Yet the two Brises have different statements. In the first Brisa, the marker is an indicator that the parties agree the slave is now sort of sold to the Goy. And in the second case, the fact that you don't have to pay miser, even if you've got grain from that land, is an indication that there was not an even a, tin, a tinge of ownership. Okay, location, not a problem. Ha, the matter zimne in the price about the first price, which was the slave, the due date came and went, the Jew didn't pay, the goy kept the, the slave. And uh, the law matters in the land case where the Jew has not claimed the, the collateral yet. He's only taking the grain from it. There is no incidence of ownership because it's prior to the due date of the balloon loan. Okay. Now, but when it comes to the slave, do we have to really tell us this, that the slave, the due date came up, they didn't pay, the guy kept the collateral? That's pretty obvious. And we also know that the owner has to free him because that's what the Mishnah said. Why did we have to bring that case? So that this is a challenge to the idea before and after the due date. Ella but in both prices the due date has not yet come. Velokasha not a problem. Hagufa, in the case of the slave price, the physical entity of the slave was used as the collateral. He actually sold him body and soul, which you can't do. And ha. In the land case, the deal was you get to farm the land and keep the payrolls until such time as I pay my loan. That's what the guy says. Okay. Next case. Turn the page. Okay. Eboy Sam, if you don't like that explanation, I'll give you another one. Bishalva Almanasla Mashkana. We're talking about where, in, where the borrower borrowed with a definitive statement, if I don't pay in time, you can collect the collateral. And here we're assuming the slave stayed with the Jew and the guy is going to come collect the collateral. Okay, below Mashkinah. 
So the due date came and the man, the guy did not pay off the loan, but he also did not yet come and get the slave. So do we assume that since he has the right to come and get the slave, the slave is now, quote, his, or do we assume since he hasn't claimed him yet, he's not his? Okay, with regard to the miser case, we say there's no miser. So maybe it means that the slave is not yet owned by the goy or transferred to the goy, even though he has the right. So obviously the first price makes the assumption that the right is a Kenyan, as it were. And the second case, in the land, since the land itself is in transferred, it's not considered a Ken any kind of a Kenyan. I'm using the word Kenyan loosely, so you don't have to pay to my sir. Okay, Tana Rabbanan, Rabbis teach. If the Goy actually takes the slave as payment of the loan. Oh, Shalachu Sik Rikion. Or if uh, Buvonim, big, strong, rough characters come and force you to get, take, the, take the slave away from you forcefully. Oh, uh, we say, uh, okay. Oh, Yotzel, Lo Yotzel Lecheres. In those cases, we do not tell the master he has to write a star Shechres. So why not? Okay, the, he, it, he transferred the slave to the goy. Okay. Ubechovalo, so the Gemara says, just a minute. We've just been talking about where the slave was collateral and he did have to write the document. Raminhu, they, I'll challenge you. Now, here's the ca a case. The king comes and take, you have two silos of grain. The king comes and confiscates all the grain in silo one because you didn't pay your taxes, something like that. Okay. The king comes and confiscates your grain. If the reason he didn't, he took your grain is because of unpaid taxes. So then you have to cover that silo's worth of grain for Trumas and Maestras from your other grain. Okay. However, imba an parus potter meiser, but if the king just confiscated it for no reason whatsoever, maybe the soldiers needed food, whatever it is, then you do not have to cover the meiser. The theory being, if you owe the king a hundred bucks and the grain is worth a hundred bucks. After Trumas and Maestras, it's only a circa $80. So you've made a profit, quote unquote, by having your debt covered by the grain. So you're benefiting from the grain. So you have to cover that grain's Maestras so that it comes out in a wash. But if it's just stam confiscated for no reason whatsoever, then you're not gaining anything. You're suffering a loss. And then we don't make you pay miser. okay? Shani Hassam, the case, and this is the answer I mentioned. Shani Hassam, the reason he has to pay the miser of the confiscated grain if it's a debt, because he benefited from the transaction. Okay, now what about, but we still have this issue if the slave is grabbed by a guy, the guy more powerful than you, why don't you have to free him? We said, if you sell your slave to a guy, you have to free him. Taishma, the Amar Rav says, Hamoicher Avdo Leparhange Oived Kachavim Yatza Lecheris. If you sell your slave to a man that's blackmailing you. He's a goy. 
And he comes and he says to you, if you don't sell me your slave for a hundred bucks, I'm going to tell the Roman authorities that you mocked the Caesar or that you stole money from the king. In other words, he blackmails you into a sale. Okay, even if it's uh, the full value of the slave, you really didn't want to sell him. It was blackmail. Okay, hasum havale lapayes. Why? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped. Uh, uh, Yatsul Heiros. He does go free. So what's the rationale? We just said a minute ago, if they take him, he doesn't. Hasum havale lapayes. You could, you know the halacha, you can't give the slave to a goy. You have money, you have a beautiful wagon, you have uh, all sorts of possessions other than the slave. You should have tried to negotiate with the guy and give him the wagon and give him, you know, your second daughter or whatever. That's a joke. Okay, that, but, and, Velo Pais, he didn't do that. He granted the guy, he said, I want your slave. He gave him the slave. Gufa, now we're going to quote Rav's ruling. Omer Rav, Amaycher Avdo Leparhan, if you give your slave, turn your slave over for a payment, but by force, by a blackmailer, you have to write a document. So Gemara says, why? My have what this guy should have done, what should the guy have done? So Gamera says, Have a payes. He should have tried to give him something that it would not have violated a rabbinic rule to do. And he didn't do it. So we can ask him by making him give the bill of of uh, freedom. Why, what does it make a difference to him? The guy has the slave. Because if he escapes, you can't get him back. Or if Jews chip in, remember this guy is free. Jewish. If they free him, he goes free. You can't get him back. Even if you buy him back from, he could give him more money than you paid. We're going to get to that. Okay. A boy, Reb Yirmi, Reb Yirmi says, <laughs> What if you transfer your slave to a non-Jew for a fixed period of time? And at the end of that period, it says 30 days, you're going to get him back. Do you have to free him? Is that considered a sale or not? Taishma, let's learn it. The Amar Rav HaMeicher Avdol Kachavim. If you give your slave over for money, you sell your slave, but it's a forced transaction to this Goyish blackmailer, or extortionist, he has to go free. Now, Rav, we're making the assumption here that these guys are marauders. They're running through the, the area. They don't want to drag slaves with them. So they've camped out for a few weeks where they're going to extort stuff from all the Jews in the neighborhood. And he wants your slave only for a time frame. He's only renting him. And yet, Rob says he goes free. So that's an, an answer to the question. Mm -hmm. So they challenge that. Ha sum lapar hanig hanig. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Ayvet kachavim she'enu chazeres. Rav, maybe Rav was talking with the idolater extortionist was wanting to keep him forever. So it doesn't answer the thirty days. So the Gemara, that's, that's why that might not be the answer. Now we're going to go through a chain of peculiar cases and ask what's the rule. If you sell your slave to a non-Jew, but the contract reads, he cannot make him do any work. So somebody's going to ask, why would you sell your slave to an Anjou? Because he's very handsome. He's got a terrific body. And they're going to use him as a stud for his shechvahs to make baby slaves. And they want him to be handsome and strong. So they rent him as a stud. Okay, I could use that job. 
Okay, chutz min hamitzvos mahu. We we mentioned during in the Mishnah that one of the problems with selling to a non-Jew is maybe he'll make him violate Torah law. So what if the contract says he can't let it make him violate Torah law? Would that transfer be okay? You don't have to write a freedom document. What about a non-Jew who lives in Israel and has uh, the legal obligation of Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noyach? That's called a Ger Tashu. So what about him? So there's a tinge of understanding that the Torah is meaningful. Or Yisrael Mumar, or a Jew who has all the obligations of being a Jew, but he chooses not to do it. That's nine pretense of all the Jews in the world today. What's the deal? Or Lakusi Mahu. What if he sends and sells him to Lakusi, who converted to Judaism but doesn't hold rabbinic Judaism? What's the law? And so to, before giving a final answer, Pashit Mehahava. One of them we can figure out. Gertoshiv Harehukov de Kachabim. A Gertoshu is only seven mitzvahs. He doesn't do the other 607. By the way, the Rus is seven, 606. Six, 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 six. Six. The word Rus is Bigamatria 606 because mm. she converted. All right. And any, okay, so is a, a, a kusi is like a goy. So now what about, but they, he's still Jewish. A Jewish, a Yisrael, he's still Jewish. Or a kusi, kusi be Yisrael mumar. What about the, not the, the apostate Jew or the kusi? Amre of the kachavim. There are people who say there are, they're not, Jewish. They're like Goyim. So, for instance, if you have a non Shomer Shabbos friend, he cannot touch your wine or it becomes treif. We do in some halachas treat a non religious Jew as a non Jew in some areas of halacha. You can't eat in his house, even if he makes kosher food, etc. Okay, and, and, and then the, the Amri others say to Israel, they're treated as Jews. So we have no answer on selling him your slave. Okay, boy, me, nay, Rebbe, may Rebbe Ami, they asked Rebbe Ami Ashaila, Eve Chehifil Atzmo Legayosis, if your slave sees a, bang, a gang of gangsters riding by, and he goes, I just take me with you. Okay, what's going to be the deal? The Ein Rabo Yochelahotzio, and the master, either because he's not strong enough, there are a lot of them, or he doesn't have enough money to ransom him, he's unable to get them back, Lo, and he can't try, can't take them to Bezdin, they wouldn't show up. Lo Bedini Yisrael, the low bedini of the kachavim, he petitions the goyish court, and they throw out his suit. Right? Mahu shiital es dama. What's the deal? Okay. Can this Jew take payment from the goyim? They take him. Now the reason the goyish court threw this out was because they gave him money. So it was. It goes back to being sort of a forced sale, okay? Amar le Rav Yirmi el Rav Zera. So Rav Yirmi comments to Rav Zera. Puk ayin the mechilte. The mechilte is a, is a list of prices. It goes go learn all the relevant prices and see if you can come up with an answer. Nafek da. The Ashkaf. So he went and he read through all the prices and he found a, an answer to this question. He believed it to be an answer. The Sanya, we have a Brysa, a Meicher Basil of the Kachavim. If in Eretz Israel a Jew sold a house 
specifically a house, not an office building, to a non-Jew. Okay, dumb of Asurin. The payment money is Asur Bahano to the Jew. It's Asur to sell your house to a non-Jew in Israel. And the, to, the rabbis made a uh, gezerah that the money, if you do so, the money is Asur Bahano. Okay. But if a non Jew confiscates the Roman legions, confiscate your house, the end, Bala, Yachala, Hotsa, O Lobedini Israel, the Lobedini of the Kachavim, the Jew goes through every theoretically legal measure to get his land back, Jewish courts, Goya's house back. Jewish court, Goyish court, and they, nobody can help him. Mutter little He is allowed to take a payment from the squatter or the uh, interloper who took his house. Okay. Furthermore, the koisev male be'arkaos shelohen. The Jew can even write a deed granting the Goy the land and register it in a Goyish court. So what's going on here? Because it's as if he's rescuing the money from Goyish hands. Okay? In other words, the house is gone. Whether he takes the money or not, it is no difference. He did not do it voluntarily. Selling the slave was voluntary. So in these cases, if the guy forces money on him to, 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 so that he doesn't get a lawsuit or he fi- takes the money because he's generous. I mean, the Goyim are all taking over a town in, Palace, in, in, in Samaria. And but he, they're compensating the landowners, so you're allowed to take the money. So Dil Mahani Mile Bias. So maybe this rule you wanted to make an analogy to the slave. Maybe this rule only applies to a house. The Kevin de los Sagi lay below bias because it's impossible for people to survive without a house. They need shelter. So when the goy gives you money, you can use that money to buy additional shelter, a replacement home. So he would not sell it because he needed it in the first place voluntarily. But when it comes to a slave, the sagi lay below of the... It's perfectly easy to live without slaves. Most of us do it all the time. Maybe we would say the slave is too costly to keep and I'm going to sell him. So and so maybe with the house, they don't make a gazera and maybe with the slave, they do. Although, or maybe there's no difference. We don't know. That was the question asked Ravami. And so Shalach Lahula Revami, they answered the fo- he answered the following quest the, the following way. Mine Ami Ravnasan. Ravnasan told me, Yisrael, I should make an announcement to every, in all the Jewish communities. If the slave turns himself over to the bandits, the ain that the master doesn't have the money or the wherewithal or the strength to recover him. Call Bedine Israel, not in a Jewish court, but of the Kachavin, not in a Goyish court. Mutul Yitelis he is allowed to take compensation. Okay, the cost of a mile of coast shell of the Kachavim, and he can even write a, de- a deed of sale for the slave to, uh, to register in the Goyish court. Mipnesha, who cannot sell the Adam because it's like rescuing the money from non Jews. So, in other words, slaves are like houses, and we know Kakarka dummy. Okay, 
signs over, sells his slave to a goy. Coins and also we penalize him, we give him a kanas. Ad The halacha is if you sell certain things to non Jews and then you become aware you weren't allowed, it was, it was shoigek, you were obligated to buy them back even at a significantly higher price. That's a requirement. So this price, so this member actually says, even if it's a hundred to one, you sell them for 10 bucks, you got to buy them back up to a thousand bucks. That's what this member says. So dafka lo dafka. Is that a guzma? Does it mean even at an exorbitantly high price or does it literally mean up to a hundred times what you got? Okay, Taishma, let's resolve it. Ta Omeresh Lekesh, Hamaicher Behem Agasal of the Kachavim, Kainz in Iso Ad Asore Bidamo. There is a halacha in Eris Yisroel that you cannot sell large animals, that's cattle, horses, or donkeys, to non Jews. It's an open Mishnah. You're allowed to sell sheep and goats. If you do sell, you have to pay them up to 10 times as much. Okay? So, the implication here is the slave is like a horse. It's a beast of burden. So, the Bryce says, and what? Said I, no, one, the memory said 100, the price is 10. Okay, so maybe the, the memory is just a guzma. It's just an exaggeration. Dilma Shaniyev, the Gemara says, yeah, but can you really compare horses and slaves? It's not the same thing. The whole Yuma the Yuma Mafkele Mimitzvahs. Every single day, this Evid Kanani, who's part, mostly Jewish, is in the Goy's possession. He, there's a risk he'll be violating Jewish rules. Okay? Whereas the horse doesn't happen to have Jewish rules. Okay? The Ikadamri, others explain this whole back and forth a little differently. Omer of Yeshub and Levi, Meicher Avdo, Love de Kachavim. Kainsin also at Asara the Dhamma. That the that this agrees with the Brysa uh, that you only have to pay up to ten times as much. So Dafto Lo Dafto. They're asking again, is the ten literal or is it a guzma? Is it an exaggeration? Taishma, let's resolve it. The Umarish Lekesh and Maikar Baim Agasal of the Kakabim. You have to pay a hundred times. So the bottom line seems to be that you must buy the slave back up to 10 times. That seems to be what they ruled. Shani Eva. Okay, again, but a slave can't be compared to a horse. The law had lay. Because if you buy a horse back from the goy, you overpay. Whose horse is it? It's yours. But if you buy the slave back from the goy, what happens? He goes free. So maybe we at least you got a horse back for your 10 times. But if you paid 100 times for the slave, you're just out all that money. Okay? Ella behem time am I? What's the rationale with the animal? Mishum the hadrule gets it back. Ulakan say tvechad. So the Gemara now asks, okay, we don't want him selling horses to Goyim. But since he gets them back, let's say he should only pay twice as much, up to twice as much. Okay, so Ella, that in other words, if the, if the only thing is to penalize him, so don't if, if, don't penalize him humongous amounts of money. He won't do it. 
penalize them in an amount that will have some you know, mamashevstik quality to it. Ella of Edmil said the Loshricha. So the reason with the slave that we can make it as much money as we want is that doesn't really happen very often that Jews sell their slaves to Goyim or get their slaves confiscated. There isn't that much interaction between them. The rabbis don't make a humongous penalty, 100 to 1. They only make it 10 to 1 by the, go- by the selling of a slave. But by the selling of a horse, that's much more common. And we do make a large penalty. Boy, me ne rev yer me a merivasi he eska shila, my her avda umes. Okay. I sell my slave to a non Jew, I have to write a star shikhus. It's a violation of a rabbinic law. If I have a heart attack as I'm handing the slave over and die, so I never wrote the star because I was dead. Does my, my, do my heirs inherit that obligation to write the star or not? And we're going to go back and forth on that. Okay. Does, do the rabbis penalize the son? Does he inherit that obligation with the kanas to get to write the document, buy him back and write the document? Okay. In Tim Saloma, you can answer this by referring to a Kohen and a Bachar. In Tim Saloma, Tsarem, Oizen, Bachar, Umeis. If a Kohen has a Bachar, he wants to be able to sell it. So he intentionally inflicts a mum by cutting its ear, and then he drops dead. So now this. Bechor goes to his kid, right? Kanso ben Noacharov, we do penalty, penalize the son. So in making an analogy from that case, maybe the son should have to buy the slave back and free him. Mishum di isur diraisa. But the Gemara says, no, that's an isur diraisa giving a mum to a Bechor. Mel, no mumim to your Bechor. Okay. Here it's only a rabbinic problem. So maybe we do not pass the knas on to the son. The imtim salomar kevan milachto ba'ive ba'aba moyed umeis. So we'll take a case that's the rabbanan. Now, working on cholomoyed is an iser deraisa. Problem is, it's not like working on Yom Tov itself. And the rabbis have the right to make rules and regs what malachas you can do and which you can't. So it beca- even though it's a deraisa, so to speak, it's a drabanan, really, because they said you can do this, but you can't do that. So we're trying to make an analogy now to a drabanan. Emtim Saloma. If you say, do you a plan to do work on Moed, you rent a tractor, et cetera, et cetera, and you die before you actually do the work, we do not penalize the children, okay? Because in the bottom line, nobody did anything yet that was us. But what would be the rule if the father did sell the slave? It's, in other words, it's not analogous. Maybe they only penalize the man who violated the rule. say, But over here, he's not there anymore. It's only the son who did not violate any rules. Or maybe we say the, the slave was part of the estate. The estate got money for the slave. So the son indirectly benefits 
by inheriting that money along with the rest of the estate. The estate obviously is still in existence. So we're going to pry and prove up, answer this question. We already answered this in a, by learning a certain Mishnah. So the shenis kavta b'shavi is, if you clear rubble, literally the word means thorns. If you clear rubble from your field during the shmita year, you're not allowed to do that. But if you did, there is no penalty. Tizra might say shviyas. You still are allowed to sow seed in that field after the Shemitah year is over. Netaiva o netaira, but if you fertilize the field by gathering dung and spreading it on the field, that's the first word, netaiva. Oh, netaira means you fence in the field and you put a half a dozen cows there. So the cows do the fertilizing for you in the course of their daily activity. If, but in both cases, you've now got manure spread over your field. Los is, let might say, shvius, that you've gone too far and you're not allowed to plow that field the year after Shemitah. The Omer of Yosef Nikitnan, we have a Messira, we have a, a, a long time tradition from the Tanayim. Hativa Umes. If you do spread the fertilizer on the field and then you die before the Shemitah year is up, Benozora, the, the sun may, har, may plant and harvest as normally does the Knas doesn't pass on to him. Alma, the day consul, the rabbinant. So maybe we now can see that the rabbis only penalize the violator. Libre, low consul rabbinant, but the rabbis did not penalize the son. And this case is more analogous to selling the slave. Amar Abaya, Nikitnan, we have another Messira. Time Tahira Salchave Rumes. You have grain that is Tahar. Your Kohen can eat it. Chover uh, uh, can eat it. And I come and intentionally make your grain come. Now that diminishes its value. You have a smaller market. Right? So, but it's not noticeable, that change, okay? Omer Abaya Nikitnan, we have a Messira, Time Tahiris Al Khaveru Mace, you mitame your friends, Tahar produce, and you drop dead. Lo Kansa Rabbanan bin Noacharov, we do not penalize the children who survive and inherit my timer. What's the rationale? So there are a couple of possibilities. Hezek she'en uniker lo shmei hezek. If the damage is not visible, then it's not a, on a Torah level called damage. Okay? The cancer rabbanan he. So the penal penalty of the paying him the diminished value is only midrabbanan. So lide kansuhu rabbanan. So only the sinner has the penalty. Libre loka kansu rabbanan. But the son would not be penalized. So this is a confirmation. Okay. Oh, now we're going back to selling your slave goods oret and various permutations. So I pointed out that the slave leaving Israel means he cannot do the mitzvahs toleberets. And just living in Israel is a positive mitzvah. So, oh, lechutzaretz, if you sell your slave to a Jew in Spain, okay, 
the rain in Spain makes you need have slaves there because there's lots of produce. That's a joke. Tana Rabban and the Meicher of the Light. See, you know, you sell your slave to someone outside of Israel. You are obligated to free him and further obligated to document his freedom. May Rabu Shani. Oh, you sell your slave to a Jew in Spain. The slave says, I don't want to be here. He has to free the, his new acquisition and give him a shechter document. Okay? So the master didn't. The, uh, the Israeli didn't. Reb Shimon ben Gamleimer, Pam Yotza, Upam in Lo Yotza. Fact of the matter is, circumstances alter the psak. Sometimes when the slave is transferred from Israel to Chutzlaret, he was, freedom is required. Sometimes when the slave is transferred to Chutz Lawrence, freedom is not required. Kate Sud will tell me about this. Imer Ploni Avdi Mecharti Hula Ploni An Tuchi If the guy writes a bill of sale to the Goy, or not to Goy, to the, even a Jew Chutz Lawrence, I hereby transfer my slave to Joey, the guy from Antioch, which is a city in northern Syria and is not Israel. Okay? Lo Yotza, you do not have to free that slave. La Antuchio. But if I write, I am selling my slave to the Antiochi guy who lives in Antioch, I do have to free him Yotza. So in the first instance, the fact that this guy from Antioch came to Israel and bought a slave, I have no proof he's going to take him out. Maybe he's going to buy a house in Israel and needs a slave in Israel. So I get the benefit of the doubt I don't have to free the slave. But if I say I'm selling him to an Antiochian to go back to Antioch, or I'm going to deliver him in Antioch, then there's no Shiloh. He's now going to be Chutzla Aretz, and I don't, and I have to free him. Okay? The guy in Antioch is a guy? No, he's a Jew. We're talking about Jews now. So you can't sell a slave if he's going out. If he's Israel. leaving Israel. That's what the Mishnah said. Okay? But now, Rev. Uh, Shimon Megamliel is saying it's, it, it's nuanced. It's not black and white. So if they, I can give myself the benefit of the doubt, I don't have to free him. If I can't reasonably give myself the benefit of the doubt, I must free him. Now, we're going to argue with that. Ha, Tanya, we have a b'risa memachti hula antuchi if I write in my document, my slave is being sold to an Antiochian Yotso, he does go free. And that's a brysa. La Antuki Shashiru Belud. But if I write, I am selling my slave to this Antioch and to whatever, this guy from Antioch who just bought a house in Lud. Then Lo Yatz, I don't have to sell him. I'm assuming he bought this slave so he can provision that new house in Lud. Okay? So again, it goes back and forth. And Lo Kasha, the Brysa doesn't argue with them, set first Brysa. Ha, the Islay, base of Israel. In the second Brysa, the guy owns a house in. Israel, so it's reasonable to presume it's going to stay there, the slave. But in the other case, the guy rented a room in a hotel in Israel for the purpose of buying the slave, and you know he's going to leave. Okay. In all these situations where he sold the slave. What? I'm sorry. In all these situations, when he sells the slave, right. and he has to free him. It seems like a contradiction. Why? You're not allowed to sell a slave. You just can't do it. If you did, then you get penalized. 
You're not allowed to speak. If you do, you get a ticket. If you, you sell get it to another Jew in Israel. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you sell it to a Goy, it doesn't matter where he is, he yeah. goes free. So we're only talking not Jewish people, Chutz Lawrence. And we see it's nuanced. All right, Vaita. Boy, Rev Yirmiya, Ben Bavel. This is a great case. Ben Bavel, Shanasa, Isha, Beeretz, Yisrael. A Babylonian Jew makes a shidduch with an Israeli girl. And he comes to Israel to marry her. And with the intent of taking her and her retinue back to Bavel. Okay? And she brings into the marriage a parcel of male and female slaves that are her son Barzel. Okay? The daito lachazer and the man's intent all along was after Shabbat brachas to go back to Israel, ma to Babel, mahu. What's the halacha? Can these slaves go with? Okay. Now there's no sale going on here, but there is a quasi sale because the husband gains control of the wife's property, even though. It's either Nixay Malug, it goes, uh, he gets the property usage, but not maybe the slaves in Nixay Malug, but maybe they're Tzon Barzel, which means he contractually must give her the property in the in original condition, or if it appreciates or depreciates in value, he has to give the cash value of the property. So we would have to appraise all these slaves, okay? So what's the halacha now? Tiboy lamanda omer hadin ima. We can ask this question, thinking that she retains title to these slaves, or tiboy lamanda omer hadin ima, or we can answer this question according to the viewpoint that he gains title to these slaves because they're tzon barzel. And all he has to do is compensate her when he divorces her. But he gets to keep them. Okay? We could answer it either way. Tiboy, Lamanda, Omer, Hadin, Ima, that the rules apply to go with her. Kevan, the Hadin, Ima, since the rule applies to her. Kedid, Dummy. It's still hers. I Dilma Kevin Dimshma Avde Le Lepere, since we're thinking of him as so as uh Nixay Malug, and he has the right to put them to work on his farm. Okay, Kidide Damu. It's as if, not the titularly, but a de facto, they're his. Okay, so that's two possibilities. Within, she's still the owner. The Tiboy Lamanda Omer Hadin Imo, we can interpret it with regard to the title, sort of, is his. In other words, you can title it to his benefit. Okay? Kevanda Hadin Imo, since the law favors him in this case, Kedide Damo, it's as if it's his money. I Dilma Kevin Delo Kani Le Legufe, since he does not actually possess them physically, they're not his. Kidi Dadamo, it's her money. So we have four ways of looking at this question based on two sheets. Okay, so what's the answer? Take who. But isn't she not allowed to take the slaves out of out of Eretz We'll see. It's not so simple. Okay, we're going to get to that right now. Amaravavuhu Shonali Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Yochanan taught me a interesting halacha that sheds a lot of light on this business. Eved Chiyotza Achar Rabo Lesuria, the master is moving to Syria. And the slave voluntarily goes with him. We the halacha is he can't make him go if he tries to, but he goes voluntarily. 
So, Mahrosham Rabo, and then in Syria, he tries to sell him. Okay? Yotzelacheres, he goes free. We're going to argue with that. Vahatane Rebchia, Ebed es Zichuso. We were going to say, we're going to say here that Rebchia said, by voluntarily leaving Israel, this slave lost his rights to freedom out going out of Israel. Look, okay, Lokasha, we had two memories, right? Not a problem. Khan the dice Rabo Lachazar in the second, the first case where I'm sorry, the second case where he does not go free. It's because the master, they only went to go to university in Syria and they're going back in four years. Okay, Khan Chain Das Rabalakhazar in the Brysa, since he's selling him, there's no intent on getting him back to Israel. Okay, that's San you have a Brysa similarly. Yaisa Eved Acher Rabba Lasuria the slave follows him the Khutzlaritz. Yatse, this Brysa says, Yatse. Slave has to leave Israel to follow the master. Lo sagi velo nothing. Doesn't the slave have an alternative? To, he doesn't have to leave. Bahatanan, we have a brisa. Ain hakol motzian. If I live in Jerusalem and I want to move to Brooklyn, I'm allowed to go, but I'm not allowed to force my wife, my kids, or my slaves to go with me. We learned this already in. Um, Yavamos. Okay? So, Ella, here's what the Brysa means. Yotzel Eved Acher Rabba Lesurya, the slave voluntarily follows the master. Omach Rabba Shami sells him there. If at the time they left, Da'as Rabba Lechazer, they plan to come back. Kaifen also, we break his arm. We force him to write a shkar shkarur, okay? The im ain't das rabba lachazer, if the master did not plan 